let's, uh, let's inspire in prayer. Let me rush into something just yet. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord. We sense your presence with us this morning by your Holy Spirit. And help us to hear what you want to say to us, Father. Open our ears, open our hearts. Help us to be in that receiving state where, Lord, we can receive fully from you. Jesus' sake, I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning again. Just love this morning. Um, the guys leading us. Uh, Paul, thank you. It's just amazing. Um, love it. I want this morning to talk about encounter, encountering God. It's been on my heart, um, speaking about this recently, and I've been thinking about it more and more. And I'd like to just talk a little bit about it this morning. As we do that, I'd like to read from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken, from, taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, here am I. Send me. I think it's even poignant on just hearing the announcements that, that the announcement that Grace was making. Who will be the people who will step up and, and to share the word of God with, with younger generations and generations coming up who will be the one to take their place and Fulfill God's call in their lives. Maybe that's something you're thinking about right now. We'll talk about encountering God. The Bible is full of stories who, of people who, characters who encountered God. When you read the Bible, you see time after time, all of these significant characters in the Bible, they had some kind of encounter with God. And sometimes we think that the Bible is simply a history of the world. And it's more than that. The Bible is a testament of stories of people changed by their encounter with God. It's the ongoing story of God told through God's um, connection with, with humanity, with us, through people who have met with Him, people who obey Him, people who follow Him. This is an ongoing story that we're a part of as well. When you read the Bible, it doesn't finish. It goes on in us. The living Word of God lives through us. And we are part of that ongoing story. It's exciting to think that you're part of this huge story that God has been, has been telling from the beginning of creation. Isn't that exciting? You and I are part of that. When you hear God's call, you're invited to come further into that story. People in the Bible like Adam and Eve and Enoch and Noah and Abram, Sarah, Jacob, Moses, Joshua... Gideon, David, Job, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Elijah, Elisha, Mary, the disciples, Apostle Paul, all these people encountered God in some way and had their lives changed. We could go on and on about men and women who were radically changed by their encounters with God. How amazing. You lost me. Yeah. 
<laughs> Thank you, Brian, for rescuing me. Give a round of applause for Brian. <laughs> How amazing it would be to, to have an encounter with God. Do you ever think about that? I mean, there's so many events, even as I was preparing for this, I was looking on Facebook and saw that there were even events yesterday called Encounter. And so we easily put up the, these kind of titles of these events because we want to have an encounter with God. And sometimes I think, wouldn't it clear everything up for us if we had this significant encounter with God? Wouldn't it kind of make everything a little bit easier if God were just to kind of write in the sky? Hello. How are you today, Andy? Yeah, yeah. Big thumbs up. Like. But God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. You know? I mean, I, I, when I became a Christian, I, and I was thinking about becoming a Christian, I wanted God to write the big sign in the sky, but he never did that. My heart was thumping. So I knew something was going on when I was sitting in the church service. But there wasn't angels flying around everywhere. There wasn't God doing sign writing above to say, Hey, it's me. Give your life to me. Promise that it'll work. <laughs> there isn't that. So how do you have a, an encounter with God? Well, the dictionary definition of an encounter, this is the interesting thing, is something that happens unexpectedly. So it kind of... You know, when we have our events and we call them encounters, it's kind of not as simple as that. It's an unexpected meeting between two parties. It's unplanned. Well, it's unplanned from <coughs> our perspective. I think there's a few things I just want to talk about when it comes to maybe how do we have an encounter with God. Number one is God doesn't obey us. God doesn't obey us. Surprise. Maybe the hardest thing for all of us to get a hold of is that God doesn't obey us. We think all the time we're praying, just ask God to do something. When he doesn't do it, I get cross. I get upset because God isn't doing the things that I want him to do. The relationship is we obey God. He knows best. So God doesn't obey us. God doesn't turn up whenever we want him to turn up. He turns up when he wants to turn up. God doesn't obey us. He doesn't live by our schedules. God doesn't have, you know, an iPhone in heaven with your schedule on his little calendar. Oh, Andy is scheduled a little, a little time with me. I better turn up and meet him. Oh, Lisbon City Church are planning this event. And I better go there. Oh, I better clear my schedule. It doesn't work like that. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Now, here's the thing. God doesn't turn up. And this is the change in thinking. Because we talk about, I wish God would turn up. But in the passage that we read, it said, all the earth is filled with the glory of the Lord. God is already here. It's not that God turns up. It says that we begin to see him. We begin to recognize that he's already here. God is here in his fullness. What stops us from recognizing that is sin. Jesus said he came to open the eyes of the blind. Because it's sin that blinds us to the glory of God being already all around us. God doesn't turn up. And it's not about... Our goodness. Look, it's not about how good you are. It's not about, oh look, hey, I've read my Bible all week. I've been praying all week. I'm bound to have an, you know, an encounter with God. God is bound to come and meet with me. It's not about our goodness whatsoever. It's about Jesus' goodness and His righteousness and what He gives to us. So we kid ourselves to think, if we have this magic formula, if I do all these things, then God is going to turn up and help me out. It's not about our goodness. It's not about what we do. Then there is no formula. 
You know, Ezekiel had this amazing encounter with God when you read it in the first chapters of Ezekiel. It's astounding. He saw things which would wreck your head if you saw them. He talks about this chariots kind of coming down and, you know, these multi-faced kind of creatures and he talks about wings within wings. It's, it's kind of like, you know, it, it's just way out there. And there's actually, there, there's, and they're probably still in existence, there's a, there was a Jewish sect who were dedicated to trying to replicate what Ezekiel experienced. We see, there is no formula. When God wants to turn up and show you fiery chariots and, and weird creatures, he will do that. That's God's choice to do that. So there's no formula. Oh, except, except there is kind of one formula. I, you know, it's that kind of paradoxical thing and I contradict myself. There is one thing. I will make you a cast iron guarantee. All right? You can take this one to the bank. You will have an encounter with God one day. Think about it. You're not going to be here forever. And the moment you leave this mortal plane, you will have an encounter with God. Promise you. So, there's a formula. Just hang in there. It's going to happen. In one way, However, I think we can increase our chances of having an encounter with God. Guys of my age and, and kind of probably older, you understand this. <coughs> you know, when you were, you fancied that girl. And Facebook hadn't been invented. So you couldn't sit at home and try and find out where they were. You had to go outside. And you literally had to walk around the streets, looking, trying to look nonchalant, and just hope maybe she would come past. Maybe this would be the street that she's going to go up to go up to the town. Maybe this is the street she's going to go to. She's on the way to church. Maybe just accidentally start to hang out in the places where she is. Anybody did that? Stop. Yeah, yeah, stop me. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's much harder to work in the past. It really is. Come on, guys, who, who, who did that? Come on, there you go, see, yeah, who oh, did that? Did that, you know, but they're worth it. And it's putting yourself in that place of having the, oh, oh the encounter. Didn't expect to see you here. Yeah. <laughs> I've been out here for six hours. <laughs> You've drenched. <laughs> you know? It's that. It's putting yourself in a place for an encounter. There's that. Putting yourself in a place where we will have an encounter with God. But there's still, there is no cast iron formula. But there are characteristics which we see in those who did encounter God. Abram had to be tested. Jacob, through his own scheming and planning, had an encounter with God when he was running from his brother, who looked who was going to kill him. Joseph, Joseph was thrown into a hole in the ground and then thrown into prison. Moses ended up in the backside of the desert. It, you know, in Northern Ireland, we would call it sort of the a hole of nowhere. All right, <laughs> Moses was in the backside of the desert before he had an encounter with God. Gideon hiding in a hole in the ground. David confronted in his sin. Has an encounter with God. Job stripped of everything. Elijah depressed. Ezekiel a captive in a foreign land. The characteristics of people who have had an encounter with God. I get the feeling it's not so much them that are hanging around in the right places to meet with God. But it's God organizing the circumstances to have an encounter with them. See, God is in charge. God is actually the one who is hanging around sometimes waiting for us. And we think, oh my goodness, God just turned up. And God's like, I've been here for a long time. Just waiting for you to get here. You know? I've been waiting for you to get here. I've been waiting for you to, to understand, to look at the signs, to recognize the signs, to, to pay attention to what I've been trying to, to tell you. I've been waiting for you. Some of us feel like we're in a hole. 
Some of us feel as if we've been thrown into some kind of prison. Some of us struggle with depression. Some of us are trying to fight circumstances. These are things that are right for an encounter with God. According to what I see in the Bible through these characters, Joseph said to his brothers, he said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Your difficulties and my difficulties are sometimes here to bring us to an encounter with God that will change us, that will affect many other people. Because God is in the business of saving lives. That's God's business, saving lives. See, we're always looking for the huge moment, aren't we? We're looking for the dramatic. We want to come in and we want to have the dramatic you know, sense of God's presence. We want to be in the dramatic service. I've been in loads of those you know, in, in years in Christian ministry. We want to have the dramatic experience, the earth-shattering moments. But let me tell you this. God is a God of the small moment. God is a God of the small. Do you know how I know that? Because he's interested in me. God likes the microscopic. God is interested in the small things. God is interested in the small moments. Elijah, hiding in a cave. He's been running. He's depressed. He needs an encounter with God. And as he hides in his cave in this mountain, the mountain begins to quake. There's a fire rages across the mountain. There's a wind that splits rocks on the mountain. And Elijah doesn't move in all of that. And then he hears a still, small voice. A little whisper. And in that moment, he covers his face and he leaves the cave to meet with God. Because Elijah knew God is a God who loves the small things, the small moments. Elijah was a man who knew to recognize God in the small. We'd be rushing out and going, this is brilliant. Look at those special effects. You do it, God. You show everybody who's boss. Yay. That's what we're like. God, will you just come down and would you strike the sinners? Would you show all those people who don't like you, who hate you, who work against you, who's boss? That's what we're like, isn't it? Show your fire. God doesn't. And then we look for it. This is the shameful thing we do sometimes in Christianity. When there's a natural disaster, we immediately go, well, that's God's judgment. That's not. God carried out his judgment on the cross. It's finished and it's complete. That's what Jesus said. But we think, you know, just God show your power. God is showing his power all the time. But we are missing it. We are missing it. Because God is interested in the small things. We saw a few weeks ago. That whole, you know, when Louis Giglio did the whole indescribable thing, how vast the universe is. I heard it put like this. We live on a comma, in a sentence, in a paragraph, on a page of a book that's in a vast library, that's in the corner of a universe that's full of vast libraries. We are small and God is interested in us. God is interested in the small, minute moments. And if we learn to encounter God in the small moments, our lives will change. Because you've been encountering God all week and you haven't recognized it. It's in an act of kindness. It's in a smile that somebody has given you. It's, it's okay. It's an encounter with God. When you've been touched by, by something that you've seen in nature, You've been touched by the beauty of creation. You've had an encounter with God. When you've had that little thought in your head that says, it's okay, I love you. That's an encounter with God. When God says to you, I've forgiven you. 
It's okay. That's your encounter with God. When we start to recognize God in the small moments, we will suddenly realize we are surrounded by Him every day. We will become more at peace. We will stop trying to search for God in these huge dramatic moments and realize we're having little dramatic moments every day. God is with us. He's all around us. We won't be chasing things because we know all we need is already with us because God is with us. But the cool thing is when we begin to recognize that this is where God actually is in these small moments, we can become agents of other people engaging with God and encountering God. Because your act of kindness to another human being is an encounter with God that they have. Simple change in the way that we see the world. Start to treat people with dignity as giving them encounters with God. There are people desperate for an encounter with God. Catherine has been working with those who are in, caught in human trafficking. There are people in desperate need of an encounter with God. For somebody to stand up on behalf of them and say, I will help you encounter God. There are people next door to us, there are people we meet every day that are carrying worries and anxieties and fears. And it's a simple matter of us going, it's okay, let me pray with you. Give people an encounter with the God that we have had an encounter with. And in fact, I'm going to say this. I believe if we become agents of God and kindness for other people, first, we will begin to notice God and kindness in our lives. Because that's the way it works. Jesus said you're more blessed when you get than when you receive. So the teaching from Jesus is give it first. Help someone encounter God. Help someone encounter God. And you will encounter God. It's kind of simple. God is all around us. Paul said on Mars Hill as he talked to the theologians, the philosophers of the day. He said, in God we live and move and have our being. God is all around us. We live and move and have our being in God. But our sinful blindness stops us from seeing Him. But if we take a step of faith, as we follow Jesus' teaching, to give first, I promise you, we will encounter God. And our lives will change. We're going to ask the band to come up. We're going to go into our final song of the morning. I wonder if we could just stand. We're going to pray for all of us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the greatest encounter we can have with you is at the cross. We thank you that each one of us need to have that encounter with you. We thank you for for the cross, we thank you for the sacrifice of your sin, your son for our sin. We thank you that you loved us so much. You gave your only, one and only son to die for us. Lord, I pray for those of us who haven't yet had that encounter. At the cross, with your son, our Savior, I pray, Father, we'd have that this morning. I pray for each one of us who have had that encounter that we will go back to the cross again. We will look afresh and see what God has done. That if there's no other encounter we have with you in our, our entire lives, that one encounter is enough. That one encounter is enough because you set us free in that. You set us free from all our fears and anxieties, our sins, our guilt and our shame. You set us free at the cross. Lord, help us to recognize you, to recognize your love, 
every day. To recognize your life every day. And help us to share that love and that life with everyone we meet. Forgive us our failings, Father, as you already have. But Lord, we acknowledge our failings. We stand before you now, Lord, in response, and we say, Lord, we have, have been and continue to be so blind. But Lord, open our eyes. Open our eyes. Let us see your glory. For Jesus' sake. Thank you.